Hello, could we begin, please? First, I would like to thank Brett Steele uh, for making possible, giving me this opportunity to invite four wonderful artists this year. Uh, and this is the last talk of the series. And of course, this evening, as you know, it's Mary Kelly who will be speaking. I first met Mary in the 70s when she lived and worked in London. And when she did, to me still, her most amazing work, <laughs> postpartum document. You may have seen it recently in Manchester, where it was brought together and reassembled. It was what I would call, but I'm a bit frightened of describing uh, Mary's work in front of her. I would call it conceptual <laughs> art without content, uh, with content. <laughs> <laughs> really, really worried. Um, it was um, work which resolutely refused to portray the human figure. And I think she is pretty much stuck to that um, all through her work. It was quite startling to have it. It was a series of reflections on motherhood, her own motherhood, uh, and she took her son Kelly, starting with, I think the Evening Standard featured them, uh, delicately stained nappies, and underneath the nappies, it was the content of what had been eaten by the child the day before, uh, and so <coughs> The work uh, was not completed for several years, seven, eight, it was five huge sections, I think the final six, six sections. Um, she did all of that work uh, in London, and it came out section by section of the ICA, as far as I can tell. That's right. Um, Mary is going to give a survey of her work, and I hope she will uh, touch on that at the, at the beginning. What I want to do now is simply to thank Mary, because I actually owe Mary a great deal. And I don't know whether she knows it. She insisted that I write about her second big piece, Interim, which was several sections, begun in London, finished in New York. And I don't know why she insisted, because I didn't have a clue about it. <laughs> but I said yes. She, of course, had used Lacan in her work. Underneath the nappies, underneath the list of things eaten, were probably Lacanian formulae on the walls as well. I might have got this in the second section, but she used Lacanian ideas. Of course, the context was feminism uh, in the mid-70s. And I went to New York, and I gave my first talk on art. And I didn't stop since. Not very, I wasn't very fast, but I didn't <laughs> stop writing about art since. And Mary, indeed, invited me both to New York and UCLA many times. So, I don't know if you know, but I owe you a debt. So, will you please <coughs> welcome Mary. <coughs> okay. So, well, thank you, Pavin. And of course, it's very special for me to be here in um, London, where I started my work and where I have such close friendships with Pavin and other people who are in this room. And uh, <coughs> Pavin wanted me to give something of a survey. Now that, I think, would be unbearable for you <laughs> because it's been 40 years. So I selected a few significant exhibitions uh, to look at the work in the context in which it appears in the, in the real world. <laughs> But I wanted to say something about the project nature of my work. It's already been touched on in a way by Harvey's introduction. And there are a few things that uh, the work is known for that I have insisted on over the years. She mentioned <coughs> uh, no figurative images, which uh, Norman Bryson very nicely called the aniconic image which I would like to come back to in, in the work and talk about. There's also 
the narrativization of space, which made me think beyond just text in the work to what was being uh, done with it in the more phenomenological sense. And it led me kind of ultimately to the title of uh, this talk about dialogic space. Because as uh, my work progressed and continued to be shown in exhibition, uh, different pieces and different projects were also presented in a kind of dialogic relation to uh, each other and to uh, space and to an exhibition context. So all of these things have become important. The third thing, uh, and most uh, appropriately to talk about here, is what I call the discursive site. I think I first termed this debate specific. <laughs> and it's kind of been taken up in relation to site-specific work um, by people like Ni Wang Kwan and others. And <clears throat> what I mean by this is that if going back to the 70s now and thinking about definitions of medium that were in place at that time, for example, Rosalind Krauss, most famously, <laughs> insisting that uh, the notion of medium was not just a physical support, but a technical one. And that meant that it, it generated rules or procedures. And I remember starting this discussion with her back then <laughs> and saying, well, what if you considered the support to be something like a specific site, an institution, an institutional discourse, a community, or an oppositional movement, then what would the rules be that it generated? What would the technical support be? What would the procedures be? <laughs> and I felt that this is what informed my first major uh, exhibition installation, uh, postpartum document. And <clears throat> it meant that Considering the oppositional movement to be uh, <coughs> the women's movement here, I felt that you, ha you un understood this as a field which was uh, being contested, that there were debates within it, that as you participated in this, that you <coughs> would be driven by the kind of questions that were asked in relation to the debates there. And those of us who took up psychoanalysis in our great aspiration to fill in the gaps here <laughs> in the German ideology, <clears throat> then going to Althusser and seeing, you know, we could look back at a different way of understanding imaginary relations to lived conditions of existence. <clears throat> Following that trajectory had an impact on the way that I made work. So it, it wasn't s simply a matter of not using the figure, but it was more a matter of how the psychoanalytic discourse in terms of the practice pushed me to look for the affective force of the event and how I could translate that materially uh, in terms of the work, which meant that it privileged a certain kind of indexicality over iconicity. But by no means does this <laughs> uh, should it be taken as some form of iconoclasm here. <clears throat> In the installation view of postpartum document that you see here, this is when all of the work was brought together later. The work itself was made between 1973 and 79. That's um, over a six-year period. And the six sections of the work that consists of like 135 pieces was brought together at the Generali Foundation in 1998. And that's the installation view that, that you see here. <coughs> now the first thing that you observe is that you really can't see much, can you? <laughs> and I think that this is more, has become you know, more important. As, as time goes on. <coughs> but what you, what you see are people engaging with rather small things, right? There's an intimate space.
space of viewing, which was really quite central to the way I was thinking about work, because the, uh, <coughs> the process of, of documenting in this extended way that I did here <coughs> was something that unfolded for me in time, which was very much influenced by the work I did in film before I started this piece. And <coughs> what I particularly liked about film of that era was real time. And uh, for film buffs here who <coughs> remember Straub and Fourier, for example, in Otan, in the last uh, 10 minutes, <coughs> they're going into Rome, and uh, they run the whole reel of film. <coughs> And in those days, 200 feet of film took about 10 minutes, and this was the absolute epiphany for me. <laughs> and I thought, that's what I want to do in the installation. And I want it to kind of unfold in that sense in real time. And then Peter Woolen at the time, he said, well, uh, you know, what's different about the way you're using duration is we could say it's more like diegetic space, or more like the kind of film <coughs> um, the imposition, I suppose, in filmic terms of something like a story. But <coughs> this unfolds as you're kind of pulled into the, the narrative over the work. However, with an artwork, I think I always tell <laughs> students, if there's anything written, don't read it. <laughs> At least not until the very end. And about, I say, 90% of the meaning that you get from a work is at the phenomenological level. And it's only perhaps <coughs> secondarily when you read something beyond just the affect of typeface and things that you might be rewarded by that kind of close examination. But if you take this, uh, <coughs> the installation as a whole, I suppose the most kind of prominent thing is that you can't see everything at once and for me and for other artists working at that time, it was certainly important to contest the kind of gestalt notion of the image. It was not about taking this in at once. This was about a fragmentation and reassembling it in memory at a later, at a later moment. <coughs> so going through the sections rather quickly uh, so I can move on. The first section that Parveen referred to that caused a scandal and was in all the papers here in, in England in 1976 when it was shown at the ICA uh, consisted of a documentation <coughs> of everything that I was feeding my child every hour, every day for one month during the period of introducing solid food. <laughs> and <coughs> at the time, uh, in the context, of what I was calling this discursive site. There was a discussion about domestic labor. There was uh, <coughs> a suspicion that some of us had that just simply providing childcare wasn't the whole story, and trying to see exactly what it was in terms of the underpinning of the sexual social division of labor. What was this thing at, that this relation between the mother and child that somehow naturalized that kind of um, arena <laughs> of domestic work. And s since I just started out doing this like you would do anyway, if, because anyone who has a child knows, they ask you to take a log and show them what you're doing. And the only record you have of how well you've done is by what comes out. <laughs> so when I look back on it now, I tend to think, you know, who was that crazy woman who did this work? <laughs> but it seemed absolutely the only way <laughs> at that moment. This was the trace <coughs> of that event. So in the second section, uh, which is <coughs> each section, as you can see, is kind of introduced with a diagram, and uh, although the certainly isn't time to kind of go into a full explanation of both the Lacanian diagrams and the other more empirical material. <coughs> Visually, it's just enough for you to kind of take in 
the disjunction between that kind of stuff of life, that archaeology of everyday life, and the diagrammatic form of representation that kind of throws you into another space of analysis as a, as a sign. <coughs> and uh, with the beginning of speech, uh, I think that this is much more subtle than the first one, because as Lacan says, <coughs> At the moment of castration, it isn't something that can be specularized. I mean, weaning from the breast seems obvious. But what was going on when the child was acquiring language was much less um, <coughs> trackable. It was, but what I did is to notice that there was a certain time in that beginning, that very symbiotic relation between the mother and child in language, where you're the only one that knows what they're saying, right? Uh, there's a break, you know, where the child starts to say kind of nonsense words, which if you consult linguists, they say, well, that's a pivot. That's when a child is beginning to use syntax independently. It shows they've got the propensity anyway to speak grammatically. And so it imposes a certain moment of separation, much less dramatic than the first, but nevertheless one that's perhaps even more formative in terms of how the child learns to conceptualize absence and establish difference. Now the, the emphasis in the piece was not necessarily on child development, but what really interested me was the two-way process of this relationship. And what did it mean for the mother? What was happening in terms of the <coughs> psychic structure of <coughs> that I began to call this specific thing called maternal femininity? Because then it wasn't just a matter of femininity in general, but the way that it was constructed in very specific. You might take it. Um, <coughs> perhaps in a more Foucauldian direction, say different agencies, <coughs> like the mother, the sister, the wife. <coughs> so here, <coughs> it became a matter of my separation also being a moment of re-establishing the, the project of sexual difference as much for myself as it was for the child. <coughs> in. Um, in a, in a detail, you see that I set out the first word. Ooh. Ooh. I have no idea <laughs> what I did to cause that. <clears throat> but the, um, the first words that are set out in type, um, <clears throat> to make them as material somehow as <clears throat> the nappies of the first section. And you see that they have to be um, printed to be read, and there's a card below which gives a context for the speech event. And this happens up to about 18 months, and that's when <coughs> he actually puts a sentence together that says, you know, see, <coughs> baby. The example that you have here is very typically the first words like here and and gone. <coughs> I'm just moving, you know, very quickly through it in the in the third section. <coughs> Here I saved the first drawings that he made, and um, <coughs> it took me a long time to think. Well, should I actually, you know, draw on them myself? And uh, <coughs> what I did is in a sense, using the perspective schema here, A, B, C, D would be the object to be drawn. And those are the fragments from the tape-recorded conversations. And the second column would be when I played them back, revised them. And the third column would be written a week later, going over those events. <coughs> so you could say, in a sense, that the, the distance point there is more like memory. But in, in another way, like the vanishing point is 
or was at least for me at that time, more along the lines of Lacan's notion of what's banishing for the subject, that is the real, and particularly the first object um, <coughs> and the mother in the place of the first object or the real. And this is followed up again in section four, where you see the typical transitional objects, the child's comforter, and then the mother's memorabilia, like the plaster cast of the hand. And <coughs> the narratives are all about that kind of moment around two years, where <coughs> it's not just the child that's doing, throwing the spool of thread out <laughs> and, and making you bring it back, but it's the mother saying, oh, you're so grown up, and no, you're still my baby. <laughs> In section five, <coughs> which took me the longest to figure out how to do because he was bringing me things like insects and various debris from the garden and then asking questions like, where's your willy? <laughs> or where's my willy? And uh, will I have a baby? And of course, as most of you know, Piaget says that children never do ask questions about the order of the universe until they figured out where they are in that initial scheme of things as boys and girls. So it was also doubling back on uh, what I was saying about the construction of maternal femininity and about the challenge to that first moment uh, that you might describe as the phallic mother, the one who has everything, who can satisfy the child's demands. And this kind of moment where the child is working out where he is in that Oedipal schema, which also means reinserting me, or the mother, back in her, her social place, as it were. In the last section, which is about writing, I think one of the interesting things for me is it, be it then beca became, in a way, um, if not critical, at least reflective on it's kind of reference to psychoanalysis. You might notice that the introductory diagram is Jakobson's primary triangle. And then, of course, that's the great claim to scientificity of the early work <laughs> of Lacan. And <coughs> the differences that are set up there are the ones that are in spoken language. Um, the difference between vowels and consonants, for example. But the, the written language doesn't necessarily imitate it. And here, of course, Derrida is quite right in, in emphasizing the kind of autonomy of this system. It has its own logic of differences, which starts out with crosses and circles, and only takes as many letters <laughs> as needed to write your own name, if you remember that as a child. This was a great project of making those first letters, that finally you could write your name down and bring it to your parents. <laughs> right. And so I'm just showing you the last one in this, because when he writes his name, it's also when I knew it was the end of this project. He was the author of his own text, in a sense. I hadn't kind of predetermined where I'd stop it, but I knew that that was um, <coughs> where it should end. And the question that kind of posed itself in terms of this discursive site at that point was then what fell outside of that frame of reference that I've been describing so far as maternal femininity. And I think it was a moment in the movement when a lot of questions were being asked about psychoanalysis itself, about whether it had become another orthodoxy, about the history of different concepts like hysteria at that time, and the questions that involve other forms of object choice, and also I thought of, well, what about the non-reproductive woman, or about, what about a different moment? Is it just a brief moment in your life, you could say, that, that you're a woman? And that was uh, <coughs> underlying the next project, which this is the installation view from 1990 at the New Museum in New York. 
And the second project, interim, the one that um, <coughs> Pavin referred to the first part of this, I did this between 1984 and 1989. And you see in the middle a work called uh, Historia, which is rolled steel. On the <coughs> and then you see Corpus to your right and, and Pecunia to, um, to the left. And uh, Corpus, which was the work that Pavin wrote about so eloquently way back then, <laughs> uh, <coughs> was a reflection on the kind of question of his hysteria. But here, rather than picturing the woman, I photographed my own clothes in positions. <laughs> and we took the five passionate attitudes of the hysterics crisis. And then I kind of reworked them in three different discursive frames, uh, which are kind of animated, you could say, by typefaces. Uh, <coughs> this one, for example, is <coughs> referring to kind of discourses of fashion. And the second one, more to the um, <coughs> original typefaces that were used in the Charcot and the third to um, <coughs> popular literature. I'm, I'm just putting up one pair here and a detail. You can see the silk screen is on the surface of the plexiglass. The image that you were looking at, which may be mysterious to you now, actually, so I should explain it <coughs> since you usually use light boxes now, but this was before that was very commonly used. This is 1984. And I used photo laminates on the plexi. But it was something that allowed me to do, to give it a certain materiality, right? A certain contingent quality when the light shines on it. <coughs> uh, that was somewhere in between what I had done with postpartum document which is simply to take the memorabilia or the found object itself, and not quite as distant as it would be if I had used kind of film or, or photography. <coughs> so the reference in terms of scale was very much different than postpartum document, because again, the size of these panels, you can see from the installation, are about one to one with the figure. So from a phenomenological point of view, it's important when you walk along a wall of, of that work, the, the reflection is very much like the, the hoardings you get at bus stops here. It's exactly that size. And there's always the negotiation of, of your own reflection in it. And that's doubled up here in the first story that you read <coughs> about trying to catch a glimpse of myself as others see me. Uh, of course, <laughs> something that Lacan suggests is impossible <coughs> and uh, very much <coughs> the way we can think about the relation of images to the kind of narcissistic <coughs> investment <laughs> that we have in um, <coughs> controlling them. And I just want, in, in terms of my little uh, lesson about not reading, <laughs> that if you see that I've used my own handwriting, you see it's the first person indicative. I think there's enough in the, in the handwriting, the grasping of the first person indicative, the highlighting of certain um, cathected phrases in red uh, to kind of set up a way of moving through the work more quickly. <laughs> In this one, it's very much based on greeting cards, the size of greeting cards. <coughs> and again, thinking about you know, the difference between the things that you get that are sent to the mother, to the wife, to the sister, to the daughter, <coughs> registered in the typefaces with mother as times bold, and wife or conju, slightly designerly using gill. Then you have universe for sister, and you have century school book for, for the daughter, which is the most sacred of all. <laughs> and um, <coughs> again, in, this, in the series, 
there's nothing, you know, welded. It's all, it's folded metal so that it just pops up and off the wall in a way that combined with the iodizing of the surface, I felt gave it that kind of comic rendition of sentimentality that you get in, in cards of that kind. And there are stories that run through the work. This, this one referring to, would you like me to read a story? Do I have time? <laughs> Just to get a, a sense of something. <laughs> so five small but clear diamonds set in a plain gold mounting. Her mother's wedding ring. She must have been 18 then when she married him, a plain man with strong arms and small clear eyes. They lived in the same town all their lives. Her inheritance, she held it tightly, pressing the gold into the soft mounting of her palm, carving out an unthinkable absence. Her mother was gone. She could not say, lump in the throat, hot tears, predictable throb, could not say. She was losing control there in that public place. A woman of her age, her education, her demurity, could not say, dead. She opened her hand and stared at the ring, five diamonds, her mother's small fingers mounted on the white of the hospital sheet, not plain or strong, but fine and slender, like her own. She hadn't noticed, had insisted on their difference. No nonsense, salt of the earth, not like the ivory tower daughter who had not noticed the elegant forehead, the cheekbones, and the playful lips, mocking the nurse who asked, will this be a home death? Yes, a homely death, plain, not costly, small and clear, mounted in strong gold. She slid the ring slowly over the end of her own slender finger, elegant nail, fine cheekbone, terrible pain, over the playful lip of her knuckle, and it fit, perhaps too tightly, but that way she wouldn't lose it. So I'm going on to another work, but I'm just kind of reminded of the parallel to discourse and thinking, why am I talking about this and telling you what it's about when actually I've written the stories to exactly explain the relationship in another way between the mother and, and child. <coughs> so in, if it's of any, any use, uh, I think when an artist talks about work, it's probably more to <coughs> to give you some kind of sense of the delusions under which they <laughs> are. Oh, I don't, so sorry for that, but I have no, no control over it. Um, but I'm sure I do need a microphone for back there, so I'll, I'll just carry on. <clears throat> Although I feel completely buzzed after I can do that. This is an installation view from the Santa Monica Museum of Art. I'm going up to 2001 now. And what you see here, again, from a distance is not much, but it's my uh, realization of the full 360 degree pan. Uh, <laughs> and it's about 200 feet long, which is just like that old roll of film. <laughs> it unfolds as you walk around it. It actually is written um, as a libretto which is then performed. But here, I just want to say something about um, the process before the story. Perhaps I should say that. Do you know what this is, most of you? <laughs> or any of you? The material? Yes, OK. So <coughs> I have an, a, made this assisted ready-made with the filter screen of my dryer. and. Uh, it, that I came to this with great difficulty through, through all the period of the 90s when I was doing work that reflected it on war and uh, atrocities that had been brought to the War Crimes Tribunal. And in this particular piece, it was based on, on a story of a boy that was lost in Kosovo during the NATO occupation of, of 1999 when his family was, was fleeing from uh, the Serbs. 
and uh, he was left for dead and then later found. Now, it seemed to me that in, in most of the, the situations where we consider ourselves to be in some way distant from those scenes, we're not in, in the sense that they filter through into our everyday life through the media. And in fact, what led me to the dryer was simply hearing a woman in the other room on television as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission describing uh, the way her son was arrested and, and murdered during the struggle against apartheid. And there I was washing, right? And uh, I looked at this ephemeral material and then with my partner, Ray, we figured out how we could make this work as a process, not necessarily as printing, but as kind of casting in low relief. So <coughs> after uh, writing the stories, what I do is in vinyl, they're put on the screen in mirror reversal. In each section is then put in the dryer, and first you do the whitewash, and then the blackwash. <laughs> And uh, it took thousands and thousands of pounds of washing. It takes a long time. But of course, it will not escape anyone's uh, <laughs> imagination to see how significant the repetition and the obsession is to the theme that I was trying to um, <coughs> visualize. And uh, I even thought, well, it, I used my own clothes at first, you know, just the old cotton, black and white, worn out stuff. And I thought maybe I can speed the process up if I buy some new stuff <laughs> that produces more lint. And I discovered, no, you couldn't. That it has to be the old worn out stuff that produces a very fine um, lint that, that filters through the screen as it kind of flows through. <coughs> so I, I wouldn't want to fetishize the process but there's kind of a way of, of controlling it that enabled me to make um, <laughs> the good enough cast. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then the particular fragment that you see here, where he, it, the whole fragment from the piece is, he speaks not a word. And to go back to this, this story and what was significant about it for me is that he, when he was left for dead, he was exactly like documentation too, a postpartum document. He was not quite 18 months old. He couldn't speak. So when the Serbs found him, they just adopted him and gave him a heroic Serbian name. And when finally the NATO troops reached their village and, and he was given over to Albanians, the Albanians renamed him Lyrum, which means freedom. So in both cases, the kind of national identity that kind of was mapped on <laughs> to this child just at the moment that he's learning to speak. Then when he's reunited with his parents, it's reported in the paper that his first word is bab or dad. So you had this incredible convergence of the <coughs> of potri, <laughs> patria, and the kind of uh, investment, many stories of this kind of children kind of lost and found that are used in national allegories. And most national allegories tend to be bloody and heroic. So I based this ballad, it's called the Ballad of Kastriat Rejepi, which is the boy's name, in a way as a kind of anti-ballad. And uh, <coughs> when I had uh, it's written in four stanzas, and it has kind of something, you know, like a, like a, and boy in it. But it's um, structured so that the first one sets up the history of the event. And the second one is just the story of the mother leaving the child, which is where I was fixated in terms of dealing with this piece. Like, what was it? that she was going through that made her leave this child. You know, what situation of terror was necessary to abandon him, you know, in, in that way. And then the third stanza 
against the way that it was used politically uh, by both the Serbs and <coughs> the NATO uh, occupation. And the final stanza is about the media, its use in the media. And the fragment that you see here, which is like the crucial line in the piece, she lays his body on the disbelieving ground, does not scream, does not look back, but bows. Always, 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 I will think of him. <coughs> I w <coughs> Shall I read you the whole stanza from this? I don't want to run over time, but <coughs> OK. Above the main room, they hide. Six days, six nights, pressed to the floorboards, cautious as the ash around them. Below them, soldiers stomping to the blunt beat of perfect solutions. In the distance, explosions. Fighting intensifies, their panic mounts, no food or water, and Castria grows weak. Minutes pass, perhaps more. Bukuri is not sure, not sure when his breathing stops, why it stops, how to start it, shaking, calling, caressing him, nothing, pleading, still nothing. She lays his body on the disbelieving ground, does not scream, does not look back, but bows. Always, 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 I will think of him, his downy crop, his coral mean, oblivious. And the rather esoteric downy crop coral mean is a thing that just occurs as the envoy throughout the, the ballad. <coughs> and that kind of iteration of the always, always, always is a way that they speak in Albanian. Uh, it sounded strange to me, but they always repeat things three times. And it has a kind of excess to it that I wanted to keep in place. <coughs> but um, it's the only direct kind of quote in the piece. Now, it's, it seemed <coughs> logical when I did this piece with the emphasis on, on the voice and the invocation of the voice that became more prominent in my work, as you can see, as, as it advanced over time, that I would uh, like to have this performed. And Michael Nyman I had known since the early 70s here. And, and he had asked me a few times if I would write something for him, which I wasn't really interested in, in doing something that was like musical theater. <coughs> but when I wrote this piece, I thought that was the perfect thing, <laughs> that I would, uh, he could write a score for an exhibition, the way he writes the scores for Peter Greenaway's films. Right? And so we did, <coughs> he wrote, piece, and then we had the performance. It's for a string quartet. And uh, I don't know if I have time to play your fragment, do I? So I'll play a short bit of this, but I might run over time a bit. <coughs> and this is just a handheld camera documenting the rehearsal.
so you can stand up and be with the musicians as they perform, which was very important, I think, because of all the um, perishable materiality, you could say, things like shuffling, coughing, exchanges that people make that show that there's some fundamental communicability, so to speak, uh, engaged in the, in the process. And, and, and you notice that with the lint units, they can, they're arranged in sections, some of you might have noticed. They're groups of four, and then they're put together to form the whole. But I have a kind of choice about whether I do this as units of two or of three or of four. And it's one of the things that led me to uh, think about the music for this, because it already had a kind of rhythm. And if I, if I used the 4-4 the four, four beat, for instance, uh, in, in my earlier works, it set a certain way of walking through the piece, although it isn't consistent with Michael Nyman's time signatures that change very, very often. But there's something about his music, usually with the sonority and with the emotional kind of level <laughs> that he kind of maintains throughout, that <coughs> I felt worked with what I thought of as this transverse sound wave with the voice running through it as the rest line, right, throughout the, the piece. <coughs> Following this work, I did another lint piece, but this time with uh, using an, an image I broke up this one photograph of Jean-Pierre Ray, which was taken in Paris, 1968, the night before the general strike, right? It's the famous Marianne figure, <laughs> I've seen the flag. And <coughs> I made this in, in lint. I'll just show a close-up so you can see <coughs> the lint panels that constitute the image. Then in the installation, which is the Whitney Biennial of 2004 that it was commissioned for. The panel, which is, <coughs> as you can see, about the size of an old 16 mil projection, <laughs> um, about eight feet square, and it's recessed into the wall and then projected over it is light noise. And uh, <coughs> thinking about this kind of question of duration, film and photography, uh, it seemed to me that in, in the 70s, everyone thought film was the most progressive medium. And you still, you have, um, <coughs> well, just about everybody. Um, Bart, of course, Deleuze, all of them say, you know, film, that's about the here and now. And photography, uh, as Bart famously says, uh, it clings to you. It's, it's kind of imbued with death, as it were. But there's something. Anyway, you can um, disagree with me on this, but I felt that there's a certain reversal, that the lint process, the actual duration, the quality of that, was more like the here and now <laughs> for me in time. And the projected light noise, which actually goes nowhere, <laughs> is the one that's imbued with death, as it were. So it's a, a very kind of different relation to images, and I think it's one that, um, also, Laura Mulvey has talked about kind of recently in relation to how we control the image now on the screen, on the small screen, <coughs> and the different kind of uh, what you might call of time in which we experience it, and something that she described as a pensive spectator. It, it's um, a good description for me in some ways of what I like to achieve in an installation. Because it's usually about a very quiet, reflective space. And um, I know I'm talking to a lot of architects here, so they might not approve of what I'm going to say, is that I don't like to disrupt the architecture. In fact, um, the most satisfying challenge is to find what I can do with the space, with a minimum or no alterations whatsoever in those big installations that you see, um, <coughs> so that it looks like it's always been there. So there's a certain kind of quietness um, to, the, to the work, a reflective quality. 
No, having said that, I go on to a piece that <laughs> destroyed everything that I wanted. This was in the uh, context of Documenta, and I found that, quite unlike my view, the curators of Documenta had very serious interventionist <laughs> um, attitudes towards architecture. <laughs> so if some of you went to it, you'll remember that famously they painted um, the Neue Gallery, which is a 19th century building, <laughs> with things like salmon pink and uh, the greens that they thought came from the period. They did the um, 18th century gallery with the, that pale yellow. So everything was kind of, um, I suppose, made to give up its neutrality. You know, they said there'll be no white spaces. <laughs> so when I went in to see my space, I was practically ill. <laughs> and wondered what on earth I could do <laughs> with that salmon pink. And, uh, but then I got to actually appreciate what they were, what they were trying to do. And had had to admit that I was like a closet modernist. <laughs> if I was going to live up to the anti-modern, or post-feminist, post-modernist, not post-feminist, but post-modernist feminist position, then I, I better uh, play ball with this, <laughs> with this idea. <coughs> so in the installation, one of the things that you see here is a, a projection. And um, I know I'm moving kind of quickly from the previous work from Paris, 1968, but the, the Marianne figure was never anything that I strangely could identify with. I had this picture in my archive for a long time, but I always wanted to be outside the frame, as it were, to be in the position of the photographer. And then I subsequently realized, after doing the circa 1968 piece that preceded the love songs work that I'm about to show you now from 2005 to 2007, that it was just prior to the women's movement. And so what actually had made sense of those political movements of the late 60s for me had been the women's movement. And it had brought to the surface something very different from, say, the interrogation of ethnicity and, and difference in the Ballad of Castor at Rejecki and the two kinds of trauma. One fundamental and psychoanalytic and the other historical and, and contingent. And I started to think that there are events which we don't, or needn't be described primarily as traumatic, but maybe epistemological. And that that was more what you might think of in terms of 1968. Uh, that is something that, that changes you, that's partly of the conscious order that uh, comes from well, Badu would describe it as something which comes unexpectedly, but it changes you, it demands your kind of fidelity to it. And I'm, I'm sure that some of us <laughs> would say that, that the women's movement was such an experience for us, and that it, what it had to do with all of the work that I made after that point is, I suppose, <coughs> um, really a fulfillment of one slogan from 68, <laughs> which was that no right to speak without les or the interrogations, right? No right to speak without the questions. I think that's fundamentally behind not just conceptual art, but um, I would see it as <laughs> underpinning what I call this kind of discursive site throughout the work. So when I made this, I went back to the archive again and took some of the photos, like this, which is based on a famous demonstration in 1970 in New York City that was marking <coughs> the 50th anniversary of, <coughs> of the 19th Amendment or the right to women to vote. And I had, I involved a group of, of younger women in restaging it. And I did that because they were actually asking me questions about that period, in some way making me go back. 
And I realize there's a very uncanny way in which people born around the time of 68, very broadly, you could say 60 to 85, or so that, that think they know what that was about, that have this kind of intuitive knowledge <laughs> right, of, of those events. And it, it didn't um, take long before I thought, well, this is obviously because they were born then. <laughs> so there's something that I wanted to kind of map onto Freud's notion of the primal scene, which I called the political primal scene. And that's, um, you know, a, a good explanation of that would take a long time, but a kind of short one would be that even though Freud says <coughs> we should be very cautious about uh, indulging phylogenetic heresies, right? He said <coughs> that after he extubated the kind of individual strata, as it says, and there still appear to be unexplainable things, you know, that you might say that these symbolic connections that have a sense of prehistory and contingency, like the primal fantasies, could take their place in the way the child reworks this event in fantasy at later moments, always investing it or filling in the gaps, Freud says, with the stories of the ancestors. So in terms of doing the piece circa 1968 and working on the love song section, I was thinking about how <coughs> um, <coughs> exactly you might consider, uh, uh, well, this is a tough thing, but how you might bring Benjamin together <laughs> with, um, <coughs> with Freud. That is to say, the famous slogan of our sentence of, of Benjamin where he says, there's a secret agreement between the, pre the present generation and past ones. And <coughs> what that secret agreement seems to be based on, he says, is something, something missing, some kind of lack that on, in the past that bears on the present and the, and the future. So I, if you think about, um, again, the idea of the primal scene, I think that there's <coughs> the sexual scenario initially, but then in, in terms of Lacan's reworking of, of this, we could say something like the unconscious is already outside, right? The other scene is in the social language is already out there in the, in the world, in the sense that you could say, as Lacan does, that the child is always uh, asking a different question. When the parents are speaking, they're not really listening to them, <laughs> right? They're, they're asking, why are you telling me this? You know, what are they telling Why are you telling me this? And so, in a sense, what I was saying is that you take this the family saga, and at the same time, there is kind of the grand narrative of social change that gets kind of carried with it. It's like what you remember not so much of the parents' words, but actually their gestures and their silences. And then I wondered, well, what are the students actually, what, are, what were they asking me when they made this inquiry about the past? And uh, were they saying that we missed something <laughs> in, in this possibility, or what was it actually in the past that kind of bears on, on their present circumstance, which has changed again. Since the moment I did this work, you now have the Occupy movement, and I had, would have a different kind of thing to say about that, but at the, in the context of this work. So <laughs> placing this in perspective, then, literally and metaphorically, you find in the middle the piece that's called Multi-Story House. <laughs> And this was a three-dimensional work, which I hadn't done before, and I collaborated with Ray Berry when I did this. And um, <coughs> on the outside of the house, 
you have <laughs> a laser cut plexi with stories, just anecdotal narratives, rather cliched. Probably Mark had something to say about that earlier today. <laughs> that refer to probably your generation or to the generation that, that was asking me the questions about this piece. And then on the inside, there are reflections of those who were my contemporaries in the 1970s. And as you can see that you, the floor is illuminated with neons so that when you walk in, you have to make a little decision <laughs> to go there and be in the warm kind of um, glaring light. <laughs> but you can never be in two positions at once. You, know, you actually can't be on the outside and the inside uh, simultaneously. But it was a way of trying to kind of visualize the something you might call an intergenerational discourse, but without subscribing to an anthropological notion. And so I'm suggesting this is one that is formed by these <laughs> overdetermining historical events, like the social movements of the 60s, or perhaps like the Second World War, which I went back to recently. And in um, <laughs> I think I have a close-up, see when you walk in. And uh, some of you will recognize your words here. <laughs> like everyone had a voice. This is kind of my <laughs> generation speaking. He didn't speak for others. The most transformative moment for me was when I discovered that I liked women. <laughs> could even understand them. Or. Um, <laughs> can you see there? Like, <laughs> I remember thinking, wow, a women's group, a woman's anything. <laughs> so <laughs> all of the, what um, seemed to be repeated, and I, I never, when I base my, my narratives on obviously the spoken word and people's voices are very much there for me that I try to invoke them visually, but um, <laughs> I don't take notes or do interviews. They're just, they happen in everyday life. And for me, this is important that they're not staged, that they're the fragments that I remember and I collect, because I think of them as the symptomatic archive, right? <laughs> they're the thing that you can go back to and talk about this um, <laughs> idea of the connection <laughs> in a way that negotiates the um, both the psychoanalytic and the historical dimension of it. Um, <coughs> now, when you move to the outside of the space, some of you might identify more with this, but on that, um, your left over there, <coughs> she says, I grew up dodging bullets in Angola, so the term feminist didn't mean much. Or the one below says, <laughs> my mother was a feminist, so yeah, I read Our Bodies Ourselves when I was eight. <laughs> and so some of them on the outside say, um, <laughs> like, when I went to college, I couldn't even boil an egg. My mother thought if she didn't teach me how to cook, then I wouldn't end up taking care of men the way she did. Or second wave, third wave, missed everything, went through puberty in Saudi Arabia. There wasn't even a first wave yet. Or, I didn't know I was a girl until I studied architecture. <laughs> <laughs> and a professor said my work was cute. Then I started to dress down. <laughs> and my favorite is, living in Egypt as a girl, I knew something was wrong with the power structure, especially in church. But it didn't make sense until I went to university and found out about feminist art in a course called Fashion, thesis, fornication, and fun. <laughs> really, someone said that. <laughs> no. So just the incredible homogeneity of the interior moment of this lightning bolt experience and the incredible heterogeneity of the moment that it inhabits now. And the places 
that you come from when you encounter something like feminism and just the uh, sheer diversity uh, that is represented in everyday life. Now, um, again, just from one thing that you might not notice from a distance is that it's always in negative. The, the words are cut out, and so you kind of see through the structure. And for some reason, that's very important to me. <laughs> that negative space. <laughs> now, this is one of three, and these are light boxes. And this is another restaging of the 1971 demonstration outside the Albert Hall against the Miss World contest. It wasn't really against the contest, but it was actually um, <coughs> at the kind of high point of situationist activity by them, and like everyone was thinking of novel ways that they could um, <coughs> revamp demonstrations. And one could remember that um, the Flashing Nipple Street Theater was just one of many very innovative things that took place at that time. But five women put uh, bicycle lights on their nipples and crotches, right? <laughs> and flashed them in front of the police when, uh, <laughs> in front of the Albert Hall. <coughs> and in remaking the piece, I got just three women who were interested, which for me, in this restaging, the casting process is like just has to do with people who are interested in this event, right? Oh, I should tell you something very funny, though, about the first one you saw, about the demonstration that was recreated. I brought all my old 70s clothes for them as props. But I found out they were dressed exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry. So, <clears throat> so with this, uh, they, they put on the uh, bicycle lights, and we did three time exposures, and that's the last one. And in fact, <coughs> what it does is kind of sends up <laughs> the, the, this kind of disappearance of the body was a way that I remember this encapsulated in the feeling of euphoria <laughs> in that moment of <coughs> being with other women in this kind of context. And it was one of the things that I felt when you're asking yourself the question, what's passed on from one generation to the next, that in fact, pleasure is most fundamental in a sense. Uh, <coughs> At Documenta, I also did a, a live version of the happening calling it a happening. It was a um, hundred women from Kazel that um, <coughs> came together on the opening night, and it wasn't announced, and at about 11, all the lights go off, <coughs> and uh, they appear on the hill. And I have a video of it. However, I, I saw someone looking at their watch. So <coughs> I don't know if there's time to play it for you. It's quite funny. But, but I don't know how you're feeling. Am I getting over over time? What? Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe it would be, if you don't mind my not talking about my most recent work that's on your poster, I could just end with the video. <laughs> okay. screen. Can you get rid of the icons? Hmm. Hmm. 
Yes. You can't get rid of it. Oh, great. How about, how about the menu? That was hard, but you can't, you can't get it off, right? the menu apparently. <laughs> That's the audience when they realize what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> they were terrified. <laughs> There's just so much amateurs can do if you say improvise. <laughs> uh. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> shall we pay you oh. the off? Shall we pay you the respect of not asking questions? You may take it off. <laughs> yes, you will? Yes, oh. okay. You have to answer yes. questions? Yes. Any comments or questions for Mary? Hmm. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I saw the piece in the documentary. You dealt very well with the salmon wars, <laughs> indeed. It was uh, great to see the piece. I want to ask you about um, what you started saying about this idea of an awareness of having a political voice in relationship to the development of conceptual art and a sort of more <coughs> dialogical approach to making work. Is, mm -hmm. If you could mm -hmm. just say something more about this. Well, are you referring, like specifically I mentioned the legacy of 68 the famous slogan about no right to speak without questioning, which I think was very fundamental to um, <coughs> the way most of us work and the kind of legacy of critical inquiry that's carried on, at least in, <coughs> in academic institutions. Uh, but um, when I was talking about the idea of, of dialogical Space, I was rethinking some of the early things that I had said about narrative, <coughs> which is very central to my work. And, you know, if you have 40 years to look back on it, <laughs> I looked at the different ways in which I'd used that and the way that the voice itself was so prominent in my imagination, at least, in my thinking and the way I was trying to capture it. And it finally ended in that piece where she sings it, right? <coughs> So this made me think more and more about why the prominence of, of the voice, not just in my work, but in students that I work with, in what I would call kind of project-based work. Not all project-based work, <coughs> but some, in s most of the instances where people have been part of um, something <coughs> which I would describe as um, one of these historically determined <laughs> events, like the women's movement was for me. <coughs> but in other cases, I think at the moment that uh, the, the trans queer movement, that comes up in the house, in the multi-story house, where she says in the trans queer movement, we're trying to carry on the legacy of, of um, that time, right? <coughs> but be flexible, right? And so I think somehow that the anti-essentialist feminism is in the LGBTQI now <laughs> movement, but that one of the, the people that I've worked with 
um, very noticeably have had this um, relation to voice. I, d I don't want to bring up something necessarily like witnessing, but I, what else could one say? Uh, that in there are things like the participant observer, that doesn't seem right either. But some combination of those where you just, you feel like you must hear and you must witness and you have some sort of responsibility to putting that into your work. And, and in the, all the cases of project-based work like that, there's this tendency to, <coughs> if, if not literal narrative or uh, writing in the work, but a tendency to use performance with the voice or, or film. And <coughs> so I, I think that I then started to say, well, there's something I would describe more as, you know, kind of beyond narrative about the dialogical. Maybe not exactly as Bakhtin would say, but I think it's thinking about that again, you know, about the, um, <coughs> the significance of um, that kind of multi vocality, the polyvocality <coughs> that one gets in the work. And then I think what I was saying to you in one, at one point about recognizing more and more that the meaning of the piece is mostly at the phenomenal level <laughs> of the experience, right? <coughs> that uh, there's something that I would call dialogical or dialogic space. I mean, because if you go into one of my ins installations, it's not as though you you read everything, but say the new museum installation, it, you kind of read across that, oh, there's the body, there's history, there's money, there's, you know, and then you're in the uh, midst of, of those, those voices as they've been, you know, visualized materially. And then I actually did the walk-in multi-story house, and then I did the, the uh, one on your poster that I didn't have a chance to get to which is based on the British domestic bomb shelter that they used here after the Second World War in the, in your, in the gardens, which um, <coughs> I worked on with my partner again, Ray, Ray Berry. And um, this is, <coughs> I, I, have, I have to show them, I'm sorry. <laughs> because I don't like describing things that have no image. So could I just go back to one image here to show them? because it's kind of the answer, I mean, continuing your question about now a kind of specific space in which the house, not just the installation, but kind of encapsulates that idea. Mine, and so does this, this last piece. <coughs> but you don't enter it, it, you stand at a distance. Do you know the bomb shelters were about eight feet square, four feet was above ground, and the other part was dug out underneath, and um, <coughs> that's just the very last uh, after the thing. <coughs> and uh, the narratives, again, you know, are, are laser cut in plexi, but they, they represent the, the um, <coughs> the, the point relevant to, to your question, again, is about the about the voices in the three-dimensional piece. <coughs> and what they have to do with is the experiences of <coughs> people who grew up kind of after the war. And uh, <coughs> going back to also what I was saying about the political primal scene. You know, when someone said, <coughs> um, like, well, do you hear, the, hear those planes? They sound just like the V2s. And I said, well, how would you know? You weren't born yet. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's the way, again, that in those silences and gestures that it's carried on. So just, um, uh, I guess I have to use this. Can, I'm still answering her question, but <coughs> this work was then shown in the context of the ballad of Cassia Rojepi that you saw before. So <coughs> again, what is set up between the two pieces, and this happens more and more as you do more work and you have more retrospective shows of it, is that you have <coughs> the one incident in Kosovo, then you have the, another piece which is actually goes back to really 
the very same geographical <laughs> location almost at the beginning of the Second World War into the kind of repetition, the unconscious kind of repetitions of, of those events. <laughs> but um, now you're architects, so you will never mistake this for metal, which most people do <laughs> because they, they literalize it. But it's made of wood, which so that you, it's, you saw it, so <coughs> that makes it more um, of an imaginary, fabricated, distanced kind of thing. But <coughs> I think it, it captures kind of more than anything I've done before, the sense of how <coughs> this phenomenological experience of dialogue space <laughs> might function. And you read those stories mostly in the mirror below when you're standing kind of it. So there's not a kind of direct access, but those kind of voices reflected <laughs> in, the, in that space below. Ah, and I, just to finish the answer to your question, which was going to be the end of the lecture, <laughs> that in the next room, in the same exhibition, they put postpartum document with the multi-story house in the middle. So you had that moment in real time that I did the document plus the historical reflection of the context that produced it in the same time. And in the entrance to the exhibition, I don't know if you can see the quote on the wall, but Pauline will remember very well how formative Maud Minoni was for us <laughs> in, in the 70s. And that a certain fundamental notion, for me anyway, how I got to the place of thinking about the dialogic space, was really Maud Minoni's wonderful phrase, which maybe is a little small for you to see. But the human environment is neither biological nor social, but linguistic. No one's ever improved on that, right, in my view. <laughs> so, yeah. It's really just to kind of comment on uh, the category you're kind of employing called the political primal mm. scene. And I, I think it's incredibly beautifully and graphically represented in your, your talking about the person who wasn't born in the war, mm -hmm. but says that they, re I mean, refers mm. to the sound yeah. of the V2 bomber. Now, I'm not sure that mm -hmm. people have any notion of a distinctive sound of the V2. What everyone talks about yes. is the nothing. It's the, the nothing cutting out. It's the stuff. silence yeah. mm -hmm. of the V2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that seems to me to be completely emblematic mm -hmm. yeah, of true. the fact that the political primal scene, in a sense, is the nothing. I mean, it's not an absence of things at all. It's the nothing which props everything else up. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the nothing that someone like Wallace Stevenson says when the snowman sees everything, uh, registers everything that's not there and the nothing that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's that nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we might end there. Oh, she's got one right there. I'm sorry. Hi, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. I was wondering if you could say something about your decision to use images of women for the first time in the, well, in the Whitney Biennial with the image of Circa 1668 and then also more in the Documenta when you decide to restage mm. um, the, mm. the demonstration. What made you... Mm the only time no, in, mm -hmm. in your work. Yeah, that that's right. That's a, <coughs> a really great observation, kind of difficult question. But um, <coughs> I felt um, when I did this Circa 1968 piece, because it was in Lind, <coughs> it's not very available, <laughs> right, in, in a way. Um, <coughs> but it was really remarkable that it, it did not have um, a textual component in the, in the installation. And <coughs> I think, you know, my 
explanation for it, which I don't think is the only one that's possible, was just simply what I was trying to tell you about something that was in the, I wanted in the field of vision representing this break or this moment that was, it could be considered traumatic, but not necessarily. There was something else, something which was, I called it epistemological. That is not what Bajiro would describe it as, but it was something similar to the notion of that event and something about the euphoria of it too that was um, <coughs> lent itself to that image. And I think with the women, with the flashing nipple work and with the, um, all the works in love songs, they're the most upbeat things I ever did. <laughs> and, they're, they're, and it was more excavating this thing. It was not that I was trying to valorize because every fundamentalism produces a certain euphoria. But I did think, and I've said it now again, that one of the things that was answered the question of what's passed on, it, it didn't seem to be the demand. The demands of the moment were, did not make sense necessarily to the people who were doing the restagings. But what you could palpably experience is just their incredible pleasure in, in the enactment and in the being together. And I felt, you know, <coughs> probably that's the closest I could come to. But I would say most, you know, even then, it's quite liminal. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, <coughs> one very slow dissolve with that film over 60 seconds. And then the flashing nipple thing does actually dissolve. And the other thing's at night, and you can't see anything but lights. And, but that's an excellent question. Mm. Well, you were very I patient. I hope I met the agenda which you set for me. <laughs> Mary, I just want to say that that was a real pleasure to hear you. And it was a very enjoyable talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.